A couple hundred years ago, the only thing you had to worry about was a hangover. You're telling me you're an investigator? More or less. Today, because of your curse thingy, you can't sleep with anyone. I'm not a teen, teen. your boss. Or else you might feel a moment of true happiness. You got already an addiction to the brooding part of life. Lose your soul. Except for the bulk of it, I was nearly tortured to death. Becoming built again. You're a demon hunter. Rogue demon hunter. And kill everyone. Fucking fantastic. I love that sound. Thanks, Cornelia. I always appreciate your perspective. Hello. Good morning. Welcome to Ale with Angel. I'm Rex. I'm Josh. And today we are reviewing season two, episode 18, Dead End. Yes, not unlike the level on Left for Dead 2. <laughs> and uh, I feel like there's definitely a shitty horror movie called Dead End. And most of our jobs, most of our life. <laughs> that got dark real quick. <laughs> well, I've been in, unemployed for a couple months now, Josh. Only a couple months? Um, it feels like so much shorter. In a couple of weeks, it will be three months. Neat. How's that going so, for you? Uh, things are getting dark, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting dark. <laughs> <laughs> Tell Annie M I won't be coming L- home this Christmas. Luckily, it's not getting dark literally yet because my power still works. Um, Tell Scott I do give a damn. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's... Oh, uh, I just realized he probably said Scarlet because that's a reference to romance Gone, Gone with the Wind. Gone with the Wind, yeah. yeah. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Sure. Hmm. But I don't know what her name was. I, I always thought he said Scott, because obviously I'm just referencing I mean, the mask. He might. Who the fuck knows? I. It's been a long time since I've seen that. I've actually been kind of meaning to rewatch it. Right. I've heard and, it hasn't aged well, which I think is going to make it more fun. Right. And my partner <laughs> hasn't seen it. Oh, really? So I've been tempted to to watch it with them. Yeah. Um. I kind of want to be there for that. I. You know. I, I think I think that could be arranged. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. We're definitely going to threesome the mask. <laughs> There's probably a word for that. Nothing I can think of. All right. There, there won't be any bondage <laughs> or anything, unfortunately. <laughs> Maybe there will be. I don't know. I'm not the one arranging the party. You are. When in Rome. No comment. Whip like the Romans whip. <laughs> cuff like the Romans cuff. Don't forget to cup the balls. (laughs) (laughs) Welcome to Ale with Angel, everybody. (laughs) Oh, man. Woo! (sighs) Fuck a doodle do. Speaking of. Yeah, speaking of fucking some doodle do's, get out your whips and chains and your sex swings and get ready to listen to a long list of doodle do's who happen to also be. Executive producers of Ale with Angel and Beer with Buffy. They are, by name, Kristen Dulcinea, Rachel Gregory, Rachel Doodledo, D. Sheringhausen, Clubby Seal, Sandra Craig, Jay Sommer, Christina, Catherine Parkinson, Karen Moon, Chris V. Man. You're just a little doodledo, chip, chip. Oh, hi, Mark. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. That, that's, Scarlet Choi. That's deep. Is. I don't understand it at all, but I'm... Do you? Oh, hi, oh, hi, Mark is a reference to the movie The Room. It's a terrible fucking movie that a lot of people think is great because it's so bad it's good. No, it's just bad. You're not talking about four rooms, just The no, Room. The Room. Okay, I don't know it. Scarlet Choi, Janella Lindauer, bad at changing their name heaps, still... Kfro Horse Dildo with BWB Logo Gnome, <laughs> Father Defenestrato, Matthew Indeberg, Kelly MC, Jesse Rain, Alex from the Heart, and Carrie Phillips. Good job. I made a decision, Josh. Go on. I, I just want to say to any patron out there <laughs> who, or an, any patron, any fan of the show that wants to support us or anything like that, I honestly think I will be making a custom perk of i'm not sure what the dollar amount's gonna be yet are you gonna make a horse dildo with a beer with buffy logo on it i (laughs) am i like i've legitimately looked into it (laughs) and i would be buying the dildo and then customizing it with 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 properly safe 
paints and whatnot. Sure. Um, yeah. It's not going to flake off. Right, right. It's uh, not going like to I, have some weird cancer-causing residue. Right. I'm, I'm still partly in the research stage, but uh, yeah. this looks very plausible and very much something I can do. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm probably going to make a, it, it'll probably be a pretty decent dollar amount because like, you know, it's got to make up for the time that it will take me and the cost of the supplies. But fuck, that's fantastic. I, I might. I Yeah, I'm actually like working on this, you know, legitimately while we're at it. <laughs> I want to offer a beer with Buffy bowling ball. <laughs> I don't know why. I always really liked custom bowling balls. I always wanted one with the skull in it, but those are just cranked off of a, an assembly line. Yeah. You got to like hand them like an old toy from childhood and be like, here, put this in a bowling ball. That'd be cool. Yeah. I'm uh, I'm slowly going to be ramping up a lot of stuff that I can make because I am putting together a relatively new workshop space. I'll have an actual workshop. Mm. Uh, between my home, I will have a, a workshop space for smaller hand projects and my dad's wood shop, which I will be slowly ramping up, making a lot of stuff. And on that list of types of projects, uh, painting and things like that, generally thinking along the lines of like painting miniatures and, and models and stuff. Mm. But uh, customizing a horse dildo, not impossible. Now, is it still going to be, it's not going to be so ridiculously large that it can't be used. I mean, that kind of depends on what I find on the market. Uh, <laughs> because, you know, there. And also, there's... Cave Ronome weigh in on this. How important, yes. how important was it that it was a horse dildo <laughs> and, well, versus just a large dildo with the beer I, with Buffy logo? I want to tell you, Josh, I want to tell you. <laughs> um, there are a lot of options. <laughs> On the internet. <laughs> I'm not, what? Weird. That, and, I, I refuse to believe that. Um, the internet is a wholesome, innocent <laughs> place. I'm just saying that, like, it being specifically horse dildo shaped <laughs> uh, is not in any way, shape, or form prohibitive. Indicative of its size. Uh, Pun well, that intended. Too, that too. But uh, did, also... Did, 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 did you catch it? Yes. Indicative. Yeah. In... Dicative. Yeah, I, I, I get it. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, the, the point is, is like, there's a lot of fucking rhetoric behind sex toys and materials they're made out of. And like, sure, some are body safe and some aren't body safe. And yeah. the last thing I would ever want to do is charge someone what will be a, this won't be insignificant amount if somebody really wants to do it. But the proper <laughs> amount of money. Yes. Uh, for a custom made sex right. toy. And, and granted, it will only be slightly over at cost. Right. Yeah. I imagine. I, exactly. Exactly. And like, I'm not going to be... at cost won't be cheap. N precisely. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> any piece of art that I do, I just refuse to... I'm not going to send out something that's shit. We basically just need to call up <laughs> k for gnome and get some specifications. k is what gnome what is the minimum dollar mark? <laughs> Or not. Probably shouldn't call people live on the air who aren't expecting it. Yeah. You know, what are we, a radio station? <laughs> we could be, Josh. You know, every time we I hear be. an ad for... Th there's this fucking iHeartRadio app ad where there's a radio station doing a prank call thing. And the person on the other end is like, ha, ha, ha that's so funny. I thought I was going to get fired from my job. And I'm like, yeah, that's fucking hilarious. Well, yeah. So, uh, just real quick, don't forget to review us on iTunes. It's literally one of the best ways that you can help out our podcast. Yes. Uh, fuck that algorithm right in the doodle-doo. Uh, do it for your favorite podcast. Or do it for us. <laughs> uh, Self-deprecating humor never goes out of style, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. 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 Somebody told me that once. <laughs> that's, that's what I heard. Uh <laughs> Anyway, on with today's business of mom synopsis. Joshua, what are you doing, Joshua? Quitting my job in a huff of self-righteous indignation? Oh, Joshua, not again. That's how you keep ending up back here. <laughs> yeah, no, but this time I did it for good reasons. <laughs> but you're still evil, right? 
Well, fucking duh. <laughs> That's my baby boy. Did you grab any ladies' asses on your way out like I taught you? You know what? I did. Did you yell evil hand so they think you were too crazy to mess with? What, what do you mean? I really do have an evil hand. You stole it from your dead friend who's not evil and you know it. Yes, and then I killed him <laughs> with it because I'm evil. <laughs> of course. You're right, Joshua. I won't question your evil hands authority ever again. Good, because I've got television-based allegorical anecdotes to regale you of that weirdly imitate my very real life, which is not inspired by fictional events at all. For instance, in today's episode of Angel, Dead End, Lindsay and Lila are up for review, which will likely result in one of their deaths. Lindsay's boss gifts him with a surprise hand transplant, tipping off Lila that he almost certainly will be their choice for promotion. Lindsay's new hand won't stop writing kill all over everything, and it's a bit of a bother. Meanwhile, Cordelia has a vision of a man stabbing his own eye out. The gang has some trouble tracking down the man, but when Lindsay and Angel's storylines converge at Caritas for the host to sort out, Angel and Wesley realize they must track down the hand's owner to get to the bottom of things. Working with a reluctant Lindsay, Angel tracks down a black market body parts facility and burns it to the ground. Cordelia is worse for wear. Lindsay quits his job in a huff of self-righteous indignation, seemingly intentionally saving Lila's life. Angel tells him to fuck off and when he gets there to keep on fucking off. Oh, also, I'll miss you because I'm in love with you and carrying your baby. Okay, not really. The end. <laughs> Ladies, gentlemen, Bunny headed the little bitches. As soon as the sun goes down, down, vamp, vamp, as soon as the sun goes down, down, vamp, 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 competition is a beautiful thing. Ooh, dear. Sorry, that's just one of those slasher fix working its way in again. My bad. Yeah, you're, no, I'm just like, your tie ins with the, the mom synopsis are, I approve. Oh, yeah? I approve. Okay, yeah, I was I worried that one might be a little too derivative. A little. But that's kind of the point. Yeah. What are you going to do? <laughs> you know, I've only got so much to work with sometimes. Right. Yeah. We actually start with Lindsay's place in the morning, kind of his getting ready for work sort of thing sure. and how he does that with only one hand. I liked how they set him up. So the first shot we see is him laying in bed, like asleep and his alarm goes off mm -hmm. and they, they just covered the end of his arm with a sheet. Genius. And like it works. I see. I didn't yeah, even think about it. It works. Like whatever. But we know his character's missing a hand. But I think the reason it was so clever though is because we see him laying there. His alarm goes off, and then it cuts to a close up on his alarm clock, and we just see a nub hit the button. Oh yeah. To turn off the alarm. <laughs> <laughs> Which you know, good on him for being able to like. He hasn't been missing that hand for very long yet. So. And you know they've they've just got a Muppet nub like. Right. Just a, a fake end of arm nub that they can that somebody's just walking around with holding yeah. in, in their in their real human hand, just slapping yeah. things. <laughs> hey, stop doing that! Don't slap me with that <laughs> fake nub. Said everyone ever. Yeah, who's been slapped with a fake nub? <laughs> Don't do that. That's not okay. Oh man. <laughs> uh, but yeah, he he gets ready. They you know they do a couple of things here that I actually really appreciated. Uh, like they show how he has a bunch of ties that are all pre-tied because he can't tie a tie with only one hand. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of little ways like that that you'd have to live and adjust things to be able to do. And that's one of them. And I just appreciated that they, they showed that. Oh, well, that makes sense that he uh, that they were pre-tied because he only had one hand. Damn, I was going to make fun of him for that, too. <laughs> oh, well, what are you going to do? It's like in... Uh, and I can't believe I'm actually mentioning this this movie, the Ben Affleck Daredevil movie. Mm -hmm. uh, they show how he handles his money. And when he is getting ready in the morning because he's blind, he actually takes money out of different labeled envelopes, labeled with Braille, and then folds each bill differently so that he can tell by how it's folded what kind of bill it is. Hmm. Because unlike a mass majority of modernized countries we do not have any braille on our fucking money 
So if you are visually impaired, you can't tell what kind of money you have in your hand. Well, that's dumb. Yeah. Luckily, we're getting to a point where like regular real money is a thing of the past, but right. it's still little nods like that of how to live with a disability. I, I really like when shows actually like pay the fuck attention yeah. to that kind of thing. I forgot that Ben Affleck played Daredevil because he also played Batman later. Yeah. And there's only a handful of actors that have played two different uh, superheroes canonically yeah and honestly uh but i don't even think of him as the legitimate daredevil it's no no the new guy all yeah. the way uh I way forget better it. i forget his name yeah me uh, too but he but him you yeah, know he's, who the, he's you know the one i mean i'm actually about to rewatch that the mm. uh, that because it's on it's on disney plus now and i'm like oh i, I really want to rewatch that cool um, do it we're not plugging Di disney plus no no that's uh <laughs> just a thing that happens to exist that some people pay for. Yes. I'm not one of I them. I do not pay for it. <laughs> Splendid. I just have, you know, access through someone's account. Yeah, exactly. Like, you can get away <laughs> without having to actually pay for any streaming services if you know enough people. Yeah, and you know what? I do. <laughs> hey, that's that's the number one reason to be poly, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling every one of your partners that you said that. Well, currently I only have one. Yeah. So. Ditto. Anyway, so he puts his fake hand on. Uh, he's got to get the, his brood flowing. Yep. He's really giving Angel a run for his mon on the broody market. And uh, I thought it was ridiculous that he stores his fake hand and his stump cover in its own drawer. Like in a, in a fancy padded drawer, too. Yeah. Like it was it was a pretty fancy drawer. Like I get um, he makes a lot of freaking money. Right. But that still seems unnecessary well i mean and those things are built to take a hell of a beating so it's not like it needed to be padded to protect it or anything like and it's that. something you need um, like all day every day wouldn't you yeah. just put it on your nightstand right i don't yeah. know uh, it does seem a bit excessive now yeah. that you mention it i didn't uh, think of that at the time but well whatever so but we specifically end this scene with him longingly looking at his guitar yeah while my guitar gently sits in the closet unused. Because he obviously <laughs> can't play it anymore. Yeah. Because, you know, he lost a hand. Uh, where did it go? I can't seem to find it. Did you check the couch in hell? Do you remember, Josh, me talking about the uh, resident at my work when I worked in the senior housing facility? Uh, the resident who uh, was missing his hand and could still play pool yes because he had a specific pool he had a pool, moose a pool, moose head attachment yeah a moose head pool playing prosthetic arm right and he was fucking good with this and it, like his prosthetic was way more versatile than my hands are playing pool you know in real life but just um, thinking about that bothers me because i really need the uh the tactile feedback of the cue sliding across my knuckles. And, you know, that's that's part of, like, living with the disability that you'd have to get used yeah, to. Yeah, I'd get over it but eventually, but it I just, don't ever want to have to, you know? It pleased me so much because, like, here's a guy who loves pool so much that he was, he, because I doubt, I doubt that, like, that's just something he could buy. He probably had to get get it custom made or something. Yeah, and that might be. They um, probably got a specialty store where you can get all sorts of handless yeah, who, prosthetics. Who knows? But my my point being is like, Lindsay has a lot of money. Oh yeah, and it seems to me that it wouldn't be impossible to get some sort of prosthetic attachment for his hand that just held a pick. Sure. Like, and, you know, I thought of that, too, but there's still a lot of nuance that you're going to lose. Yeah, sure. And but, you, obviously you'd never be able to finger pick. And, yeah, he would probably have to completely relearn how to play the guitar. But if music is so important to you, you'd figure it out, wouldn't you? Like, I mean, he's still at his left hand. That's really the most important. You're right. Like, but... I, I think it was just a hobby that he enjoyed. I don't think it was one of those things that made or broke him. And honestly, I felt like it was shoehorned into this episode. So yeah, a little bit. Um, I, my it's just my thought is because I have I have hand issues that greatly limit a lot of the things that I can do. 
art wise and I've always been an artist and I can't really draw anymore, but I still doodle from time to time and I still like very dedicatedly make art and I have found ways around the issues that I have with my hands. Absolutely. So just to me, sure. it seems like if something, something is so deeply important to you, like you're going to figure it out. I'd have thought about it a lot more if they had ever established anywhere in the show before this episode that he plays guitar yeah. or sings. Yeah. Let alone both. I, I agree. So I agree. it really felt shoehorned into me. But you, you're absolutely right. And, you know, I have hand problems, too, so I completely understand where you're coming from. Um, but there's I think the point is it, it was still some fun backstory. And there's lots of things that we clearly don't know or understand about Lindsay. Obviously, he's a country boy, which I never in a million years would have guessed. I mean, the truck tells us that. Well, and of, of course, that means he would play the guitar since fucking, of course, he's a good old boy. Yeah. Fucking goes full redneck whenever he is feeling emotional personally, and a little, and a little verklempt. Personally, I like the backstory. And it's a fun touch. I don't hate it. I don't think it's perfect, but it's a fun touch. It, it's one of those things that remember when he first kind of had his turn like a long while back before Holland died. I say, I say, yes. Yeah, Holland, right? Holland. Okay. So before Holland died, when he was like wishy-washy and was, wasn't sure if he was going to stay evil or not, and he decided to be evil, mm. had they changed it up and made him good and had kind of his backstory being that he was this good old boy kind of mentality? Like, I would have Why don't loved, you go back to farming, boy? I just would have loved to see where that character would have went, and this kind of hints at kind of what that character could have been. And it makes me a little sad that they did what they did with this character and just kind of had him dig his heels into this being evil thing. I think it, it would have been a better character if he'd we'd gotten to learn more about him and his backstory and that kind of thing. Yeah. I don't want to share my feelings. I don't want to open up. I want to find the guy that killed Tina and I want to look him in the eye. Then what? So we cut from there to suburbia hell, where we see some random family getting ready for work. Your uh, happy-go-lucky, uh, classic American family. Nuclear. 2.5 kids. Nuclear. Yes. Nuclear. <laughs> <laughs> um, suburbia, utopian, American hellscape. Yep. And they're all getting ready and all this and everything's perfectly fine. Everyone's happy until the dad decides to grab a knife and stab himself in the face. What? Hey, sometimes, you know, having kids, they need their vitamins. They need their <laughs> books. They won't just keep fucking walking to the car. God damn it. You just got to stab yourself in the eye <laughs> and make a TV oh show about God. it. And that's exactly what he did. He's living oh. the American dream. Dude. Sir. So he stabs himself. Of course, they cut before he actually stabs himself. And we cut to Cordy having a vision and her like jumping and reacting to seeing this dude stab himself in the face. Yeah, frankly. And this was intense as fuck. It was. I really feel more <laughs> bad for her than I do the guy stabbing himself in the eye. I mean, apparently he chose to do it. So, like... I guess. I mean, even all the way to the end of this episode, I still don't understand why he stabbed himself in the eye. Like, he didn't have a haunted hand. Right. He like, had a haunted eye. Like, his hand... Wouldn't he just see weird things? Right. Like, his hand... Was, was his hand. Was still his hand, yeah. Yeah, and it's weird and confusing, but... It wasn't quite worth a plot hole emporium, yeah. but... We're, we're getting ahead of ourselves on that one. But it's still, like, this, this bit, how they did this, where they showed, essentially, the vision. Yeah. And then, when it got horrible, they cut to Cordy reacting to it. This was better than any single version of seeing a vision that we have seen yet in this yeah, show. I agree. Like how fucked Cordy is from this vision, this whole episode sat with me so strongly because of the way they did this. Mm. And, Oh dude, this was, this was visceral to yeah, me. I was glad I was wearing headphones in the coffee shop because <laughs> I would not have wanted people to overhear that. Right. Well, and I had, dude, I had to fucking pause it and take a moment. It was intense. 
I was not expecting it. <laughs> but yeah, uh, Cordy reacts to the vision, freaks out as you would, like, like Jesus you Christ. And cut to the Gerba thumpity thump, where the Six Flags guy is running <laughs> a meeting. A big fancy meeting uh, on a roller coaster. I mean, at a conference table. Uh, his actual name is Nathan Reed. <laughs> yep. Boring, if anybody gives a shit. So Nathan Reed wants to know about this utility company lawsuit that's going on. Random lawyer is like, oh, yeah, there's, this is what's going on. He's like, I know. What are we doing about it? Lila pipes in and she says, well, we can just tie them up in litigation forever, indefinitely, so that they never miss a dividend. Hurrah. Problem solved. And I'm like, uh, that sounds like a terrible yeah, idea. That sounds like not a problem solved. That sounds like a problem perpetuating. Exactly. <laughs> sounds like a lot of extra work that you just made for and, yourself. And then uh, Lindsay actually pipes up and says, well, actually, litigation is a bad PR move for a utility company. How about we... And a guilty utility company yes. at that. Yeah. And how about they pay back some of the money, we get a cut, and they get to save face. Great plan. I thought it was impressive that the mere mention of suggesting that they were guilty about something makes Nathan and the other lawyers just absolutely shit their pants. Right. And you could just feel their chastity belts cinch right the fuck up around their assholes and go, you can't be suggesting that they admit that. Right. Like, they just don't <laughs> do that. They don't... They're lying to themselves as much as they are everybody else, Right, it seems like. The thing I like most about uh, Lindsay's delivery here is he very obviously just doesn't give a fuck anymore. Like, he just doesn't. He doesn't care about the fi the company's money. He doesn't care about saving face. He, ju he just does not give a shit about playing the game anymore. And that reads in his whole attitude of how he's sitting and how he presents this problem and everything. But it just, it fucking works because, like, that's kind of the attitude you need to have to seem confident about what you're doing. He's It comes off as so nonchalant in that situation where, like, to me, it reads like, no, this is, this is a lawyer who knows what the fuck he's doing. And just, it's such an easy lob yeah, most cases of confidence, in my experience, are because people legitimately don't give a shit. Yeah. Every time I've ever been confident about anything, it's usually because I don't give a shit. When I care too much, like Lila does. Like, yeah. I'm actually going through a very similar situation right now, except I'm not um, <laughs> fighting any internal employees for a promotion. You're also not an evil lawyer. I'm, <laughs> you don't uh, know that. And <laughs> I mean, I know you're not a lawyer, <laughs> <laughs> but I am fighting to get a promotion and I am going to be as pissed as Lila was at the end of this episode oh, right? if I don't get it. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. Because I am the right fucking choice. Anyway. So, yeah. Like you said, Lindsay Counter suggests that uh, the company, uh, without having to admit any guilt, does a settlement where they pay out half a billion dollars and then they're still up three billion dollars. Yeah. Boo frickety who. Wolfman Hart skims 20%, everybody wins. Yep. And then Nathan Reed asks for an update on Angel. Doesn't seem particularly happy with the response, but Lila points out that while Angel is back with his old friends, you know, they're he's not breathing down their neck, which is a good thing. He's not trying to kill them all, which is very important to their dividends i'm sure not that we've ever truly understood what exactly they want angel to right. be doing which i kind of had the impression that uh he was playing into every move that they were making and when yeah. he was on the war path it was kind of a good thing for them because they wanted him to go evil but lila's like oh well he's not trying to kill us so that's a good thing and i'm like well what the fuck do you want I don't get yeah, it. I, what are you trying to make I, Angel do? What's your plan? Yeah, at What's this your point, evil end goal? At this point, I vastly do not understand what the fuck they're even trying to go for. I don't think the writers sense. understood when they were writing it. Yeah, precisely. But also, one could argue easily that Wolfram and Hart is a very opportunistic company. Yeah. And changes their mind on a semi-daily basis. Anytime something shinier comes along. 
So maybe they have completely new plans. All the, every different episode that we watch, who knows? So the meeting the meeting gets adjourned. Lindsay and Lila have a little bit of a spat argument, kind of a side thing where they're all they're both pissy at each other. Uh, mainly, Lila is basically pissy that Lindsay's throwing her under the bus, sort of thing. Even though, like, he's not. She's just not piping up and saying the same things, I guess. And I didn't even think that she was performing her job badly. He was just doing slightly better. Right. Because yeah. he's not stressed and he kind of wants to die. Yeah. But ironically, can't get them to kill him <laughs> because he doesn't care and they sense it. Yeah. It's weird. It's a really weird catch-22. But then Nathan pulls Lindsay in, aside into his office and of course, this makes Lila go, oh, no, I'm fucked. Which, you know, valid, I think. Yeah. Or, yeah, I mean, I hate getting called into an office. It feels <laughs> right. I mean, it's been embedded into us from early school age that being called to an office is a bad thing. Yeah. And that you should be scared. You're about to be punished. Yeah. And that really stuck with me. See, I never, I never, surprisingly, never had that many moments like that in high school. Which is weird. It's in, ludicrous. In grade school. Especially um, as an adult. It's like, oh, no. Am I right? in legal trouble? Then I'm not in trouble. Yeah. What's your problem? I've had some moments like that uh, in jobs. But uh, the best and smartest thing I've ever done is in response to having one shitty job in my, my mid-early 20s, I... Went through and read a fuck ton of the Michigan legal code mm -hmm. regarding employment and employee rights. And so I know that fairly well. Not to the extent of like what a lawyer would know, but I definitely know more than what the average worker in, a, in Michigan knows. Which is and any employer's worst nightmare. Yep. And most employers don't like it. Because mm -hmm. there, there have been a few times where employers tried to fuck me over and I'm like... <laughs> funny thing here that's not gonna happen as soon as i got diagnosed with adhd i went through and read all the legal code in michigan regarding disabilities and made sure i knew what the fuck i was getting into if i were was announcing that i have a disability uh, hmm. which i do every job i make sure it's known with big fucking flashy lights and and everything because very important that i have that to fall back on should i need it definitely so <clears throat> six flags guys like hey now Lindsay, we know you have feelings okay <laughs> especially bad ones about angel but you're really not allowed to have feelings in front of other people okay story of my life also <laughs> here go do this random thing it's a surprise i've cleared your schedule don't worry about it. It's no, you're, it's, just go. We're not an evil corporation. We're not going to send you to your doom or anything. Yeah, we only murder people that we fire. And we haven't fired you yet. yet. That you know of. <laughs> huh? Huh? I'm coming to get you. I'm coming to get you. Yeah, like, under these circumstances, would you go to this fucking appointment? Yeah, I mean, your ball's deep at that point. Uh, well, yeah. Whatever. And... Lindsay obviously does not have any sense of self-preservation at this point. No, not at all. Um, so, like, I, I totally get him going. But I think if I were in the circumstances, I'd be like, oh, sure. I, I'll head there right now. And then I would leave the building and the, the city and the state and the, and the country. country. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe try and find an underwater city to live in. Yeah. yeah. That, that seems very plausible. <laughs> I would run. See I would about, run and be like, uh, I'm not going to some surprise appointment. See if you can alter <laughs> your genetics so that you can have gills suddenly. Yeah. yeah, do the thing in like Minority Report where you get different eyes put in. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A person needs certain designer things. You shouldn't be trying to eat my friend's brain. My friend's brain. You're a vampire. Uh, cut to the Hyperion, where Cordelia is still a bit upset about the stabby guy and doesn't have any more details for them to go on. Yeah, they she's, decide she's a bit touchy 
Uh, like you could like say reasonably so like of course yeah it's obvious that the visions are really starting to get to her so they decide to check the morgues and the demons and the hospitals quote of the day here gun says in regards to calling the hospitals and say what did my uncle check in with a knife in his eye they only give out information to relatives i just got the calling the hospitals job didn't i yep it's like well you seem to know the most about it <laughs> have at it Good luck. And notably, Gunn tries to offer Cordelia a cup of tea. She just stares. He leaves her alone. Well, and they're doing this thing where it's the, kind of a hit and miss thing. When they're doing a kid gloves thing. Right. Some people are like, some people will be appreciative of yeah. that. Some people just want to be left alone. I'm one of those. Look, if I'm having a bad day, leave me the fuck alone. Sure. I will cope and deal with it. Um, my partner, on the other hand is the opposite of that. I was going to say, some, everybody loves to be offered tea. Why not? I don't see what the problem is. I think the only reason it matters is because I don't get the feeling that Gunn would have offered tea normally. Yeah, he wouldn't have done it otherwise. Like, He's doing it because of the situation, exactly. and that's what she doesn't like about it's, it. Um, and I totally get, like, if I'm having a bad day... I don't need somebody, like, going out of their way to coddle me in some way, shape, or form. Sure. Like, if I'm having a bad day, I want, I just want things to be as normal as possible so that I can cope with my bullshit. I imagine it's like speaking differently to your dog because there's a storm and the dog is nervous. Yeah. You really need to speak normal to the dog yeah. to give them a sense of normalcy. Exactly. Don't treat them differently. Same. Do the same with people. Don't treat them differently to make them feel better. Treat them the same. Yeah. Unless you're the kind of person that specifically wants to be babied. Right. And right. I'm not and saying that in a condescending way. No, some, pe some people do. Some people don't. Check in with them and then act accordingly. Yeah. You know, just, uh, just a little bit of advice from us here at Ale with Angel. Uh, we're not mm. the moral police or anything, but, you know. Fuck, we're not. I uh, Oh. Are you? Shit. Um, Sorry, we weren't supposed to say that publicly. We... We are the moral police, um, and you should listen to everything that we say. Shit. Because... Um, if we're not, we have some problems. Got some backlog editing to do, I think. <laughs> shit. <laughs> oh, jeez. Oh, dear. So, uh... <laughs> cut to the hospital. Yes. Lindsay gets a surprise surgery. Surprise! <laughs> yes. Shing! They lob off the tip of his uh, stub, and he goes, hey, I already lost that once. No. Um, so <laughs> the doctor comes in, and he's like, don't worry that we didn't warn you ahead of time that you need to fast for 24 hours, but happy new hand day. <laughs> oh, right. That didn't happen either because this is fiction. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's fine. They're just using mainly black magic anyway. Yeah. They, like, well, they brought in a pocla demon. It's like 85% real it's like 85 percent black magic 15 percent real surgery i don't know it looked more like the other way around to me like they they surgically attached the hand and the pocla demon come in be like waved its hand its very spidery josh like fingers <laughs> over <laughs> the wound and and you know it like partially healed to like an old scar okay fine invert what i said i don't care see if i care <laughs> so halfway through the surgery Lindsay was apparently awake the whole fucking time, and they right. just made him super groggy and relaxed. Um, they bring in the Pakla. What amounts to basically a Dementor Wraith floats into the room. Like, did it sprinkle powder or something on Yeah, him? it was like some sort of evil demon dust, you know. So, like I know you, you... Fairy dust, but evil. Evil fairy dust. Yes. Perfect. So, yeah. And then he fucks off. And I thought it was hilarious that he exits towards the door. Right. Even though he clearly disappears before he hits the door. Yeah. Like, he and could like, have gone any direction. He came from the door, too. But he, <laughs> he, like, appeared in the room. Yeah. It's like, dude, why are you moving around the room at all? Just appear on the bedside. Right. And sprinkle your dust and then fucking disappear. He's going like, to get a little bit of exercise. I don't know. I, I doubt he's actually exercising. He's just kind of floating. He's just kind of floating. Yeah. yeah. He didn't seem to be mo using any muscles to float. Unless he's walking on a bunch of little tiny feet. I was going to say. <laughs> which is terrifying. That's a, that's really terrifying. I, I was going <laughs> to say he was probably on a skateboard, but. Yeah. He could, he could be on a skateboard Have, 
and moving really smoothly because he has a bunch of little tiny feet. This makes me think. Have you ever have you seen any of the fucking uh, memes about how the Powerpuff Girls can hold things? <laughs> No, because the Powerpuff Girls don't have digits and right. fingers and whatnot. I recall, but they can like hold things. And I, someone did a comic where they like showed the Powerpuff Girls holding things, and they like zoom in on their hands, and they have like little tiny, like thousands of little tiny hands oh, that you no. can't see. Oh God, make it it's stop. it's pure nightmare fuel. Yeah. <laughs> oh. My life gets ruined a little bit more every day. <laughs> every day. So uh, they take Lindsay to post up. Yeah. Cut to the Hyperion. Yep. Back uh, later that night or the day, I guess. I don't know. Uh, Gunn is calling the hospital. Honestly, he's coming up with a, a solid story. Oh, know? yeah. Uh, I mean, it sounded like he was kind of sort of making it up as he goes. He was like, yeah, I'm Gun Tur. Gun Tur. Right. You'd think he'd probably called enough of these that he'd like have a routine down for it. Right. I guess, well, but... I think he also needs to make up a different story for each one so that he's not leaving a trail. Potentially, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Otherwise that could get suspicious if anybody ever put two and two together. Right. Um but he's coming up with nothing. Uh Angel and Wesley return. They came up with nothing. There's fucking goose eggs across the board. Mm-hmm. And they're all worried about Cordelia, who started cleaning and hasn't stopped all day. And then they decide against their better judgment that they really need to press her for more information. And Wesley then says, hey, Angel, I'm your boss. Fuck you. You do it. Sounds like a you job. <laughs> Why? Not entirely sure. Punishment? Selfishness? A tactical awareness that she will respond better to, to you? Uh, no idea. I just feel like it's the right decision. That being said, I think that Angel is the right person to have the conversation. Yeah, strangely. So he makes a shitty joke about the picture frame that she's been cleaning. It's like, oh, clean enough to see your reflection, but not me, because I'm a vampire. Ha 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 ha. Remember how he's a vampire, everyone? Yeah. Yeah. We, we can't I, forget that. I love that they give us those little reminders every now and again. Yeah, we'd forget completely. Otherwise. I definitely had completely forgotten. Yeah, and that apparently does it for Cordelia. She uh, she starts to remember some more stuff and manages to get the name of a school from a school bag, Delancey. Yeah. And because uh, every school bag I've ever had definitely had my school's name on it. It's probably a, a private school, though. So right. fucking rich people. What are you going to do? So they assume that, this, that these people have kids because they're cereal bowls and obviously the school bag. I mean, never mind that adults eat plenty of cereal, whatever. Right. Cordy continues to be distressed and unable to stop seeing the guy stabbing himself. God, that would be rough. That would be that really would be rough. rough. I I feel like they're going to explore this issue later. It seems like the way that they're setting it up. But I'm wondering, just for now, if it's because she continues to suffer from the vision as long as the victim continues to suffer. Right. That's what they're hinting at. This is the first time they've ever really hinted at that, though. Or is it until the core situation is resolved? I don't know. I wonder. I think we're going to find out yeah, in the next it's, it, couple of episodes. It's obviously getting worse, whatever it is. Absolutely. But yeah, An Angel says that, hey, you know, the Delancey school thing is something they can go off of and, you know... They kind of have a slight little moment there where Cordy's just kind of beaten down by this whole vision thing going on. Yeah, and Angel makes the same mistake Gunn did, asks her if he can get her anything, which only stresses her out more. Which, you know, I, I get that. I know we already kind of had a big conversation about this, but I just remembered similarly from Cordelia's perspective, I see why that's really fucking annoying. Because, like, when my dad died, my grandma kept um basically trying to force food on us because that's just something she does anyway right and it was magnified like tenfold um yeah. in a time of real stress and grief for all of us and she made even though i everybody had already said no we don't need any food grandma like 10 times or something she still went and made this gigantic plate of toast just toast like seriously two full loaves of bread toasted wow. and uh, <laughs> i <laughs> i finally literally had to yell and be like no i don't want anything before she would fucking leave me alone about it so yeah boundaries which, which that's a hard situation because like you know that it 
Like she's grief. Up, she's upset just yeah. as much, if not more, than me. You know, it yeah. was her son. Yeah, exactly. So I can't be a dick about that. You know, but still. But yeah, it, and it's I. You know, I'm I'm someone that if I'm dealing with a situation, I fucking hate it when everyone's like, "Are you okay? Are you okay? Yeah. Are you okay?" Obviously, I'm nothing's changed. I'm not any more okay now than I was five fucking minutes ago. For fuck's sake. Yeah. But yeah, I I burn out on that kind of shit quick too. Really, so I quick. totally totally understand where where Cordy is coming from. I was hoping for some demon fighting tonight, but I wound up with a delivery job instead. If I come back here on the end of a spatula, I'm expecting some serious workman's comp. I'm just messing with y'all. So, cut to Lindsay's apartment. Yeah. Where, where he, he picks up his guitar. Yeah, he, like, he's got a shiny new hand. Uh, yep. I mean, he did never in a million years deserve to ever be able to play the guitar again, but here he is. Playing play the, the guitar. guitar. And fun fact, this is the actor actually playing the guitar. He I believe does it. know how to play the guitar. He the, do, this is him singing. He's not bad at playing the guitar. Um, but also those couple of chords he's playing in that scene where he's just sitting on his bed, not that difficult. Well, maybe it's a light warm up. He hasn't played in a while. Sure. And also, you know, it's a new hand. Yeah. It's like a fresh it, it probably doesn't have fucking calluses for playing guitar. Oh, it's certainly I can not. imagine, like... I mean, you lose calluses so quick, if, yeah, even if you're just not practicing. Right. Anyway, cut back to the dog and sheep, snort, snort. Yep. Uh, later in the office, Lila gets worried when she notices his hand. Yeah, hey, nice hand job, <laughs> asshole. <laughs> it must be so nice to be loved by your employer, unlike me. Lindsay's like, yeah, well, you should try being likable sometimes, <laughs> stupid. Well, she does point out that the fucking operation would have cost a lot of money. Yeah, like a quarter mil yeah. just for like the medication or something. The I, shaman. The shaman. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. But uh -oh. she doesn't realize that they used demon magic for it. So maybe they got a discount because of the demon magic. <laughs> like, like, well, considering how well it goes. It's hand discount. Yeah. Like. You can get a hand back, but it's evil. <laughs> and, you know, it's like when you go to get, like, used tires for your car, they're super cheap. But they're but, used. But and they're going to they blow out They on might the, murder you. They're going to blow out on the highway. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Makes perfect sense. They, Of course they cheaped out on it. Yeah. That explains everything. Which, you know, you're about to hear if you haven't mm -hmm. watched the episode already. So they go in and they speak with this Lycor guy, uh, the CFO, who Mr. Six... 60, as I like to call him, Six Flags guy, mentioned at the, uh, he mentioned this Lycor meeting earlier. Yep. Lindsay and Lila, for some reason, have to tag team a single client rather than spread their skills around more evenly. You know, they are co-operators of Holland's job. I just want to mention that, like, it's been bothering me that, like, nobody in the entirety of Wolfram and Hart has acted like they've gotten any kind of promotion whatsoever yet they have Holland's job right and they just somehow changed it so that while they gave these two Holland's job now they have to go through this Nathan dude who's the new Holland but yeah different position and it's like yeah, they're not like, like in charge of anything the way right. that Holland was right like how Holland's, do they have Holland's job Holland seemed like kind of an entity unto his own sort of thing. Like he, yeah. he was, not, he didn't have any boss breathing down his neck. And I get that there's some sort of doesn't seem like Nathan shit. does either, other than right. the senior partners. Exactly. It's like so they they literally only got the promotion in like name and maybe salary. Yeah, but they're already evil lawyers, so I imagine like. And then also, what, what's a, what's a couple more million when you already have plenty? And those meetings are a joke. Was there anybody right. else at that meeting? Lila and fucking Lindsay were the only ones talking. Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, no, Lila wasn't as on point as Lindsay. Everybody else was just fucking silent. Kill them. Right. It, just let Lila keep being a lawyer. Who cares? Yeah. I don't want whatever. But, yeah, anyway, the this meeting is... Uh, relatively interesting and it kind of shows us that L Lindsay's actually quite a good lawyer still evil mind you he's a very good evil lawyer but he is a good lawyer yeah 
because he casually informs this Lycor guy that an offshoot of his company named Dryzon is solely responsible for giving people cancer, not Lycor. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's heavily implied here that he's making up this plan as he goes um, to cook some books and make a fake shell corporation. Yeah. And when Lindsay informs him that Dryzon is going bankrupt this summer and they all get evil, satisfied smirks on their faces about it, this guy stupidly asks Lindsay. He turns to Lindsay, who's scratching on his notepad, and he says, are you writing all this down? Let, let, me, let me repeat that. Rando business schmuck asks Lindsay, who's telling him how he's about to get off scot-free if Lindsay is writing the things down that Lindsay himself is saying. Yeah. Fucking what? Obviously, they're like, man, we need somebody to react to Lindsay writing because he's, you know, it's supposed to be, well, fuck, what's, there's an actual term for it, but it's like automatic writing or something like that where it's like uh, psychic writing where your hand like writes on it or draws on its own. There's a fucking term for it and I can't think of it. I have no idea what you're talking uh, about. I Hold on. I need, I need to. Okay, so is this like it, a note-taking right, skill well, no, no, or it, like, it's, like so, an occult mythos it, it's thing? An, it's an occult thing called psychography. Huh. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. But basically the idea is, and you see a lot of it referred to in spiritualistic circles where a psychic can like commune with spirits but it only happens through automatic writing where their hand like the spirit is taking okay. control of the hand and it's yeah. writing on its own yeah because that's totally a thing and like people you know yeah, definitely like, don't con other people on that kind of thing like but, we're watching evil dead or something right right sure but anyway it, it, Lindsay's hand is writing on its own Lindsay realizes after this dude mentions it that oh my hand is writing on its own and it's writing the word kill over and over again and I'm struck to, by the weirdness that, like, they can see his notepad. Yeah. Like, if, like if they were trying, if they were you, even. You attempt. can see my notepad from where you're sitting. Yeah. If there was just the word kill written at random all over the notepad, you'd probably notice that that's weird. That yeah, it's I not could, written I sentences. Could, I could probably pick up on that. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm and like, further away than that guy. And like, sitting. fun fact, it's also a yellow legal notepad. Yeah. That I put my notes on. So, mm -hmm. like, it's even the right exact sa same kind of medium. So, like, they don't notice that he's just writing the word kill. Especially Lila, who's, like, sitting across from the table super close. Easily to see their note, his notes. I bet they did see it, and they just didn't expect anything else. And that's why he <laughs> right. sarcastically said, you getting all this down? <laughs> he's just going to kill everybody. These he is an guys. evil lawyer. They are, yeah. I, <laughs> that's why I come to evil lawyers. Kill, kill, yeah. kill. yeah. I'd be disappointed if it was anything else. <laughs> so uh, Lycor bro is singing Lindsay's praise, much to Lila's chagrin, who facetiously agrees to Lindsay being a talented lawyer, yeah. etc. Like, his argument is evil, but it is a brilliant evil. Evil! But beyond that, a nice little block path, but beyond that evil. So Lindsay freaks out about his hand uncontrollably writing kill, um, but he does it with chill and he's like, ah, oh, I have to go. You I know, wanna I wanna diarrhea. say chill with some soft air quotes. <laughs> yeah. Like not hard air quotes. It's definitely <laughs> more chill than I probably would have reacted to my hand doing things on its own. Ladies but. and gentlemen, it is a uh, ale with Angel and a beer with Buffy first. We have never once before had soft air quotes. Yeah, this is some soft air quotes. There they are. <laughs> <laughs> It is more chill than I would expect, but it is not. It's not a hundred percent chill. Not completely chill. No. So he leaves the Lycor CFO guy alone with Lila, who assures him nothing is wrong. Everything's fine. Ah. Yeah, everything's fine. Cut to Lindsay's apartment. Lindsay sits at his desk with a pen in his haunted hand, waiting for it to do haunted shit. He stabs at it with a letter opener to provoke it, but it yeah. doesn't react. And you know that's what you do when you're trying to get something to do something. You poke it with a stick. Uh, at this point, I was theorizing that his hand must have a conscience and it's mad about what he was doing 
with the CFO of Lycor. That would have been a great direction. That to would take have been a fun it. plot. Yeah. It wasn't an evil hand, but a good hand, and it didn't and like him being evil. Yes. I think that would have been brilliant. I think that would have been better than where they went with it. Yeah. Oh, well, what are you going to do? Lindsay stares at his hand and interrogates it rhetorically. Who are you? <laughs> Cut to the Hyperion. I'm. I. They really missed a good moment where the hand like just starts talking. Yeah, it should just start talking at him. <laughs> and like great. he, it would have been. We would have just seen his lips moving and his voice talking. But or no, even better. He he's like holding his wrist and his hand is like writing like fucking liar liar. The pen is blue. <laughs> the pen is blue. The goddamn pen is blue. <laughs> The goddamn Trizon Corporation isn't <laughs> separate from Lycor. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, cut back to the hotel where we find out that Angel is a shit fucking tipper. Absolutely shit. Goddamn it. And I did not like the way they played this off. Oh, I like they. The way this moment shot, the way the acting is done, it's like. They arranged it so that we were supposed to feel like some sort of malice towards the fucking delivery person for being irritated they only got a dollar tip. Yeah. When in reality, like, fuck you, Angel. Because the look on Angel's face was very much, wow, that's an unreasonable thing to say yeah. and unprofessional while you're still within earshot. However, if you've only been tipped a dollar to deliver this much goddamn food. Yeah. You're a fucking dick. Yeah. Like, and sure, this was in, like, what, 2000, 2001? Doesn't matter. So, like, Doesn't you know, matter. inflation, a dollar is more then than it is today, but I, I was don't there. fucking care. I was I don't there care. that you'd still tip at least fucking $5 yep. on that much food. Yeah. Fuck fuck you, Angel. Whatever. We we liked you. We used to like you, and now you're just a bad tipper. Yep. Bad, you know, murder whoever you want, but you're a bad tipper. Yeah. Fuck this. I'm done with this fucking podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so Angel comes up uh, to the counter. He has a bunch of food. And, you know, his excuse to, when Cordy asks is like, well, you know, I don't need food to survive. But, you know, sometimes I get a hankering. And uh, he basically ordered one of everything. And she, like, questions why he ordered one of everything. I really fucking loved his response, though, because his response is rather than trying to come up with some fucking random lie, mm. he just admits, I couldn't remember what you liked. I didn't know what to order you. So I basically just got one of everything and figured you could pick. And when she's like, well, why did you do that? He says, well, you said that you were tired of people asking you for things or asking you know, for input. So this is what I did. And there's this momentary pause and you think for a second that maybe Cordy is going to like rip into him or something, but she doesn't. She's just like, I love you. Thank you so much. And, you know, this makes Angel smile and she says, you should do that more often. And basically he's like, what, order you food? And she says, no, smile. And like, it's a great little interaction and it is a beautiful little sprinkling of the relationship they used to have before the shit hit the fan. And I really enjoyed it. And you know what? I give major kudos to Angel because he did exactly the right thing here. He did not ask her if she wanted food. He did not ask her what she wanted. He just provided some options and then let it be. Like, here's some, if you want food, here's food. Pick whatever. I will leave you the fuck alone. There's really only one important question to ask here, Rex. What? Does Angel poop? I would say that if <laughs> he consumes food, he would. He would have to. He would have to. Yeah. I think... But if he can't live off of it, then his body's not digesting it properly. It's going to be messy. For the most part, the main waste of used energy that the body gets from food is actually breathed out but yeah the the waste from poop is unused material and so i would say that if angel eats a bunch of not blood he poops it all of it 100 percent. unless it's like really bloody meat i think maybe he could get something out of that but mostly mm. it's all poop 
He, he's just a poop machine. So he, he's more of a poop machine than we are. So he just he poops a big compressed sandwich. Kind of, yeah. He basically poops a whole sub. Yeah. It's just kind of a liquid sub at this point. Oh, God, that was graphic. <laughs> <laughs> well, we I mean... We don't need not, to talk about the consistency of his poop, not but I'm liquid just saying... Per se. like, I'm just saying, like, he's a more effective poop machine than we are because, like, we use some of the food we eat. He uses zero of the food he eats, so, like, he makes poop more effectively. All right, you've taken this question way too seriously, <laughs> so... My bad. Uh, well, so now we all know what she likes. Being brought a selection of food without being asked. I mean, who cares which sandwich she liked the most, right? Um, oh, and also she likes it when Angel smiles. And I guess we're just not going to see any comeuppance from Angel buying her off last episode. Uh, I suppose Wesley's disapproving look was the worst of it. Maybe I'm well, speaking we, too soon. You know, I, you, we, you might be. You things, might be. I don't remember. Things I can don't still happen. I fucking remember at all they, what happens. Um, but Cordy gets some residual vision info about the knife guy, uh, yep. realizing that he was happy about his eye just before he stabbed it. And Gunn and Wesley come in, procedurally it, dramatizing the crime solving process. Specifically, he was happy about his new eye. The yeah. eye was new. Correct. Yeah. That is an important clue. And uh, Gunn and Wesley had followed the Delancey school lead. They found that the family had left the country and the house has been, or that's their story anyway. And the house and has they're been sticking to it. Clean, <laughs> the house has been clean top to bottom. Uh, but Gunn <laughs> found a piece of bloody trim that they missed. And it's a dead end again. Oh, boy. <sighs> Because Angel's like, well, there's there is one more option, and everyone around him is like, oh no, don't we can't do that. And then there's a couple of beats where they're, as the audience, we're like, what what are they talking about? And it's like, oh no, he has to sing. Say there's another way. <laughs> <laughs> it's so cartoony, but it's it's still fun. Yeah, I, I liked it. I liked it. I can hold a note for a long time. <laughs> Actually, I can hold a note forever, but eventually, that's just noise. It's the change we're listening for. The note coming after and the one after that. That's what makes it music. And cut to... Singing! Oh, yes. Cut to... Caritas! And Lindsay is there playing his fucking guitar with his brand new goddamn hand. I have fun fact information for you, Josh. Uh-oh. Not only A, is this him playing his guitar and singing. This is this is Christian Kane. Uh -huh. Not only that, but he wrote it. I was wondering if it was an original song. It was an original song written by him and producer David Greenwalt. Mm -hmm. They wrote the song together. Nice. More importantly, Christian Kane is in a band. And of course he is is in a band. They have two self-published albums and one official produced album uh, that released back in like 2011. Uh, but yeah, he like, and he still makes music. Matter of fact, he has written music for almost every TV show he's been a regular on. Oh, nice. Yeah. Huh. So this, like he, this is legitimate music that he wrote and I, I fucking love it. I absolutely love that they're they're bringing in the actors' talents, and they're like, you know what, we and, need to give something to Lindsay. And how handy was it that they just happened to have the perfect device to use to m seamlessly make that a part of the episode? So handy they had to give him his hand back. Well, not just that. It makes me wonder if they were planning on, uh, like, how long had they planned out this karaoke bar thing? I mean, they knew. David Boreanaz couldn't sing. Right, right. They, I mean, they made him, and then they've got this running gag over how bad yeah. he is, and they made sure never to actually let him sing ever again, because, boy, and God. I hope they continue doing that. Yeah, boy, howdy. <laughs> it's fucking awkward. <laughs> I was so afraid that, like, we actually would have to deal with, with him <laughs> singing again. I'm I'm grateful they went a different route. <laughs> well, that's why one of my quote of the days is right here. Cordy says, you should pick something short. Angel replies, I was thinking about Stairway to Heaven. Wesley says, don't even joke about that. <laughs> <laughs> How long is Stairway to Heaven? Um, also, like, Stairway to Heaven would be a shitty karaoke song. It's not lyrically that complicated of a song. No Stairway. 
denied. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have no idea how long it is. But uh, the whole A team. The eight A team. Eight minutes. Hmm? Eight minutes. That's how long Stairway to Heaven Only is. Only eight minutes? Well, yeah. shit, he should just sing Albuquerque and I be mean, done with it. Honestly, for, for a fucking Led Zeppelin song, that's pretty long. <laughs> uh, most Led Zeppelin songs are not all that long. Like, their their most famous song, uh, the Immigrant Song, is super fucking short. I think Angel would have been just fine at Albuquerque, Weird Al's Albuquerque, <laughs> because it's mostly just yelling incoherently. Yeah. Yeah. Except it's rather... That's actually one I kind of legitimately coherent. could see myself doing in karaoke. <laughs> it's the chorus where you might have some issues. He does actually sing the chorus. I... I didn't have to say I'd have to do it well. I'm just yeah, saying I could be comfortable doing it. That's fair. And if I'm going to sing karaoke, at least I'm not the only person who's going to be comfortable or going to be uncomfortable with it. Oh, like, yeah. It's going to be all of us. Absolutely. Yeah. So <laughs> the whole A-team, by the way, that's my um, completely new and definitive, definite replacement for the Scooby gang. The A-team yeah. collectively swoons over Lindsay. Except for Angel, of course, because right, he's bitter. He's bitter and he's getting deeply uncomfortable and seemingly self conscious. Um, it's like, why? You know, you can't sing. Whatever. So, I, another quote of the day here uh, Angel says, <laughs> What is that? Rock, country, ballad, pick a style, pal. Wesley shushes Angel and Lawrence says, Angel cakes. Don't make me ask you to leave. Right. It's Which, like, don't be getting butt hurt about this just because you don't like Lindsay. Yeah. Or just because you're mad that we know that you can't sing. That like, we know that you know that you know that we know that you right. can't sing. And like for fuck's sake, like they like there haven't been evil people in this fucking bar before. Sure. Come on. Yeah. Angel, you fucking know. Like, sure. This is this is a, a neutral ground sort of circumstance. Fucking get get over your shit. No, I think I think the reason that Angel is all fucking butthurt here is because he really likes the song. And he's like, how dare you, Lindsay? I don't like you, and I, but this song is good. Don't make me like you. <laughs> oh, yeah, you know, that tracks. That being said, it is a pretty good song. It's definitely not my style of music. Right. But it is pretty fucking good. Yeah, they because he definitely ends up having a great time with Lindsay by the end of this episode. I, yeah. I think they've got a great frenemy ship. Which is why I wish Lindsay had gone good. I think it would have been great. I know, the well, chemistry was there. Baby steps. He's on, he's on his way. I hope. Um, we'll see. We'll see. I, I remember one specific thing about Lindsay that happens in season five, but I wouldn't call it good. I can't it's not bad. I can't remember, but yeah, I don't, we'll get there eventually. I don't remember any of the like context around it, so yeah, now. we'll just have to wait. Um, so Lindsay finishes singing. Yep. Lauren treats him like he's an old regular. Never mind that we've never once seen or heard hide nor hair of him here. Well, you know, he comes in on he comes in on Tuesdays. They come in on Wednesdays. Uh, like yeah. you know, you don't necessarily one regular crowd is not quite the same as the other regular crowd. That's it, true. It, that That's happens. true. It happens. But yeah, basically, uh, Lindsay's like, hey, I have this evil hand. Tell me about my fucking evil hand. Uh, sure, my evil hand can play a good, uh, mean guitar, but like, you know, I have an evil hand. And Lauren's like, oh, well, I can't tell you anything about your evil hand. But Angel and uh, the A-team here, they they can help you out. One more butthurt comment from Angel before we move on too much. Lindsay says, look, I need help. And Angel says, I'll say you might want to start with his singing. Hi ho! Right, like, come on, Angel, come on! You're not dumb. Like he's, you can tell he's good. He's so butt hurt. It's hilarious. I think. Anyway, Cordy Gunn and Wes all take the opportunity to gush over Lindsay in person, like he's some sort of fucking celebrity. Right. And okay, my last Angel quote: "Is everyone drunk?" <laughs> and okay, he's he's not off base there. It's like, all right, guys. Right. Okay, he was yeah. good, but he's still they, an evil ass fucking they lawyer. They are definitely fawning over Lindsay more than seems they should. Like the the writing of the characters doesn't fit their fawning. Yeah, it's, you get what I mean. Yeah, it's a little out of proportion, definitely. Yeah. The, out of proportion. That's the phrase I was trying to fucking think of. So Lauren informs everyone that it's time to play buddy cop movie. Yeah. Lindsay is pissed and runs outside like an upset teenager who had his hand cut off by a vampire. I don't want Angel's help. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'll kill you if you come outside. No. Gunn is confused why they're not following Lindsay since he's their lead. 
But Angel and Wesley put two and two together that the transplants are the common denominator here. Yes. Like, you know, the eye that got new stabbed eye, out. New eye, new hand. Hey. Uh, I see you've played knifey spoony before. I see you've played uh, eye handy before. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Better give that eye and a handy, but not with a kitchen knife. But more importantly, since luckily for them, it was uh, Lindsay's hand, new hand that he held the glass with, they have a fingerprint. They sure do. Yeah. yeah. And I wish Kate was back and was brought in on this. That would have been great. That yeah, would have been lovely. <sighs> Miss Kate. Then somebody would have actually made a hand job joke. Yeah. And we wouldn't have had any material for this entire episode. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> so they, they need to follow the hand. Angel picks up the glass. Lindsay was holding stairs with fingerprints. I wonder who it belonged to. Cut to waffle, 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 and hot sauce. Ugh. <laughs> what, if there's chicken on it, it's fine. I don't like hot sauce. All right, cut to waffle and hot sauce. Wolfram and Hart. At night. At night. At night. Lindsay sneakily snacks himself into Six Flags Great America, his office, and hacks into his computer. I'm sorry, but if your fucking password is Z E N all capitals. And that's it. You fucking deserve to have your shit hacked. And if there's a comma in your username, right? Please just fuck off. Yeah. Z E N. Zen. Yeah. You're, you're in a multinational, huge ass, backed by demons corporation of lawyers, and your fucking password is Z E N. It was a capital Z. It was a. <laughs> it was all caps. Everything in the fucking screen was all caps. Oh, was it? Yeah. yeah. Well, I know it's. I mean, I know, I know that it's early 2000s, so like computer software was not all amazing and everything, and they aren't trying to like up the budget with fucking graphics. Computer but, like, storytelling still, is always very different than the reality yeah. of computers. But the the point is though, three characters, mm -hmm. and like, it wasn't even obfuscated. Like we could read it as he yeah. typed it. Anybody could have been watching from across the room, right? And been like, "I see your password." I believe it's Zen. I wouldn't put it past uh, Nathan Reed, who's probably like really old about how he deals with computers anyway. <laughs> so like he probably because there's no hint whatsoever as to why Lindsay knows what his password is. Yeah. But it's very obvious that Nathan Reed is just the kind of person that would have been like, I'm typing in my password. Z E N. Because old people, you know, because it's kind of something my stepdad would do. <laughs> Despite the fact that he's afraid of being hacked. I always worried about that when I'm putting in my um, pin number while I'm uh, at an ATM. Like, what if somebody's got binoculars and they're in an apartment complex watching me? I mean... Like, at that point, they kind of deserve to rob me. They would have to have a clone of your card first. Yeah. But second off... Or like, they would just have to come mug me. Second off, there's a very it's a very easy way to like obf obfuscate your hand to where you you know. Oh yeah, exactly I just read. to get around it, I just do a quick little multi finger type. Yeah, exactly, and then I, I have the motion down, and I use three fingers to type my pin. So. Oh like, yeah, we got this. We're some savvy millennials. That's right. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so he finds Lila on. What's his name? Na Nick? Nathan? Nathan. Six Flags. He finds Lila on his to-do list and then searches Fairfield <laughs> Clinic. And it looks like some boring shit. I didn't see anything noteworthy about either page. I paused it and I read through it. It was just random description. Well, not random, it, but it was general descriptions yeah, it was of both very things. brief and not like a way to find more information. I don't know where how the fuck this... Yeah. There was no to actual files. There was no subtext found in the yeah. actual text here. Uh, yeah. I, I even paused it to read some of it, and it's all just drivel. It didn't matter. No. None of it mattered. Cut to the Hyperion. Yes, where Angel returns with some information on the hand, and his methods are questioned as to how he got that information. Yeah. So uh, the guy's name, the former owner of the hand, is Bradley Scott, 30 year old white guy. He did 2.5 years at Soledad Prison for embezzlement. Uh, Angel holds back details from Wesley and Gunn on how he found this info while Cordelia researches the name. And Angel eventually caves in that he hired a private detective to get the info from the police department. Uh, Wesley and Gunn are a bit upset about, um, the, hey, but we're supposed to be the private eyes and we're supposed to have a friend in the police department. And... 
It's like, well, yeah, you fucking know what happened right. with Kate. Well, first None of off, you seem to have licenses to be a PI yeah. or friends in the police department. And that was my first thought, too. It's like they're dogging on Angel for not having a, a cop in the inside. Where where's their connections? Yeah, they don't. What about them? They're fucking private eyes. <laughs> yeah. like, all four of them are. He's the one guy who had the connection. And like like you said, they know what fucking happened to, to Kate. Yeah. Like for fuck's sake. But yeah, this gets to one of my quotes of the day. Angel says, you know, when I was in charge here, nobody questioned my methods or my singing. <laughs> to which Cordy replies, you're half right. Yeah, that was a good one. Um, also, the other thing about them giving Angel shit over this, Angel isn't the boss anymore. Right. How is this on him? This should have been on Wesley. Yeah. Whatever, I'm over it. Cordy finds Bradley Scott on the computers in the interwebs, and uh, he apparently used to work for Wolfman Hart, go figure. He disappeared yeah. after reporting to his parole officer. Gunn assumes that they whacked his hand off for Lindsay and got rid of him. I was surprised to learn that he had gone to jail for embezzlement and not anything particularly evil. Like, if it's an evil hand, and it didn't come from somebody who was in any way really notably evil. Sure. Well, the, like, the hand seems evil... Yeah. I mean, knowing how the episode ends, it's definitely not evil. Right. Like, like it's not. But, like, the, I was confused at this point as to, like... That's okay, fair. But it's it's an evil hand. Sure. He worked for an evil law firm, so he's probably some level of evil. But, like, you know, I'm sure there's people who work for that law firm who don't know it's an evil law firm. Like... Yeah. I mean, you know, we've all worked for a company... Without I'm just going to end everything. That, I'm just going to end that sentence well, yeah, right there. Exactly. We've all worked for a company yeah. because we needed to pay the bills. Exactly. Almost, I'm really hard pressed to think of any of them that probably isn't some kind of sociopathic evil. Like everything, the entire, the entirety of capitalism yeah. cannot exist without slavery. Yeah. It, so, like the whole system's exploitative. What so, are you like, you do? can't. Just because someone worked at Wolfram and Hart doesn't mean that they're inherently evil. So, like, True. what I was con just so confused. It's like, okay, if, what the fuck? I, I was expecting them to be like, this hand belonged to a mass murderer or something like that. I think the like question that, you know? really comes down to who was he embezzling from, right. how much, why, et cetera. There's, yeah. there's lots of weird circumstances there. But the big thing at the end of the scene that they know is uh, Bradley reported to his parole officer one time and then disappeared. Fucking disappeared. Correct. So, there's still a place in this world for traditional research. Even a solitary soldier such as myself recognizes that a free exchange of intelligence benefits the common struggle. Oh, also, I brought in your mail and newspaper. Cut to Wolfram and Hart. Lindsay spies on Lila rifling through some files, and she steals one. And yep. we don't get a good look at the file. We never, actually never revisit the file at all. We don't know what she learns from this file. But we do see a gun in the contents of her purse. Yes, we did see a gun. Just a um, tiny little six-shooter. Yeah. Uh, notably, or notably, Lindsay does not interact with her at all. He, he sees it. He notes it. And then he fucking leaves. And it seems impossible that she didn't see him there, but TV storytelling, whatever. Well, she's in a bright room and he's in a dark hallway. I, I believe it. Okay. Her, her eyes are adjusted to the bright room and she's been looking through files. Like, Fair enough. Yeah. Cut to an apartment. Yes. I'm trying to remember whose apartment. Uh, the parole officer's oh, apartment. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, we don't ever get a name for the parole officer. Yeah, fuck this guy anyway. So some gruff looking older guy, probably 50s-ish, yeah. lets Lindsay in without question. Right. Okay, one question. And all Lindsay says is, I just want to talk. And he's like, oh, okay. And opens the door right up. He must just want to talk. Fucking <laughs> dumbass. So... Uh, whatever. This guy seems like he can handle himself. He certainly thinks he can handle himself. And he definitely has a gun. Yeah. <laughs> so he's not too scared. He's a parole officer. He deals with a lot of shitbags, as he is very quick to inform us. And uh, Lindsay asks him about Fairfield Clinic, where they get their body parts for the transplants. And this is a huge red flag. And the guy goes apeshit when Lindsay doesn't know 
the code, hard yeah. air quotes. And there probably is a code system for when he's working with a Wolfram and Hart employee right. f- in regards to uh, supplying body parts on the yeah. black market like they do. So when Lindsay doesn't know the code, he's like, well, we're done here. And they fight. I mean, we cut to commercial. Then we cut back to uh, him having Lindsay pinned against the wall with gun to him. And punches are thrown. Yeah. Gun pops out. Angel breaks through the window. And I think he throws something through the window specifically, yep. like a brick or something. He, he throws something through the window, and then this dude walks over to the window and conveniently stick his stick and conveniently sticks his head out the window. Yeah, I knew I shot him. It's like, well, then don't fucking worry about it. Yeah, like he's dead, but he's not. And you like deal with demons and shit through world from an well no maybe he doesn't know that i guess no i don't think he's uh, this guy's real he, low yeah, level <laughs> he does he does react like a normie when it comes to the vampire face yeah he's uh, just a fucking parole officer that he's just a crooked cop that's yeah, all he is yeah he sticks his head out the window to which angel lassos the goddamn thing because he can't come in mm-hmm. so you know handy Get just he just needs to put one body part out the window. Mm-hmm. So Angel's got him by the neck with a rope. Yep. Lindsay again acts like a butt hurt teenager. He's like, yeah. Why aren't you trying to kill me? That's my lead. You're choking my lead. Blah 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 blah. <laughs> Angel replies with, "He's my lead. He's my lead." <laughs> what are we in a schoolyard here? <laughs> Seriously though, like. It's like the first thing Angel's done and said all episode, where I'm like, "Thank you." Like, and for fuck's sake, Lindsay. Angel is obviously better at getting information out of this guy than you were, and you were about to be fucking Swiss cheese. Yeah, the whole way that Lindsay responds to all of this, I find a little confusing, but I guess he was a little confused, and that yeah. make, that's why. So, Because yeah. we know, yes, we know that people aren't completely black and white, and that confuses Lindsay. Yeah. Because he just, you know, he, he seems like the type. You know, he's evil. Yeah. Everybody's either uh, good or evil, and he picked a side firmly. And I, he's like, damn it, Angel, pick a side. Yeah. And I, I really like Angel's method here because the dude's like, what? You can't kill me. Wolfram and Hart would do worse. And Angel's like, I don't need to kill you. I can keep you alive and feed off you for a month and vamps <laughs> out. And, like, Lindsay's got nothing on this tactic for interrogation. Like, say what you will about Angel. The man gets results. Oh, Absolutely. I mean, just being able to intimidate a guy into thinking that you can do worse things than Wolfram and Hart. Yeah. That's talent, whether it's true or not. Like, he convinced the man in the moment. The beauty of this method is it, it isn't so much that he has to convince the dude that he can do worse than Wolfram and Hart. It's just that he can do bad enough soon enough. <laughs> He's definitely there, and Wolfram and Hart's not. Well, yeah. I guess they kind of are. Lindsay's there, but he's not really trying to do worse. Exactly. Um, so the only new information we leave this scene with is that the parole officer took Bradley to a random address the last time that he was seen and that Lindsay is a complete and utter twat. Yeah. That's okay. It's not entirely new information, right. but like, now it's completely confirmed. We don't, we don't learn anything specific about it other than we have an address and we got some buddy cop m- movie shit going on soon. Yep. Cut back to the hotel. We see Gunn and Wesley spying on Cordy as she cries at her desk. That's that's an important thing to do to your friends that are upset. Definitely. Spy on them. Yep, that's what I heard. Somebody told me that one time. Um, and this is when Gunn notes that the vision hangovers are getting longer. I kind of wish they had done a little better with ramping this up through episodes. Like they they've done a little bit of foreshadowing to this, but not a hell of a lot. Not a whole lot, but they call back um, to an episode where she was saddled with a whole bunch of visions all at once. Yeah, which I don't particularly recall, but I vaguely remember. And they use that as cause for alarm and worry that she yeah. might be going crazy. And one of the things that Wesley mentions is how these visions originally were in Doyle and he was a half demon and that maybe Cordy being human, it's just too much for a human to deal with and like breaking down her mind. And it seems to be the case that that that's what's happening. Sure. Uh, And then they overhear Cordy talking to someone. Turns out it's angel on the phone and they barge into her office and scare the bejesus out of her. 
as you do. Like you do. We're afraid that our friend is having a psychological breakdown, so we're going to kick in some doors. Everything's an emergency. You yep. got to be the big dick boy heroes. Yep. So she's just on the phone talking, to, actually talking to Angel. Yeah. And Angel tells them to wait there. I don't know what the real point of the phone call was, but there it is. So they're going to wait there while Angel does some stuff. Yeah. Well, and he's telling them, I'm, I assume, it doesn't really hint at what he's telling them, but I'm assuming that he says, hey, we, I, we got an address. And just by we, in. I mean, I'm not hanging out with the evil, evil Lindsay. I'm going to go look at this address. Mm -hmm. You hang out at home. And that's smart. You know, update yeah. them so if something goes wrong, they know where to look. Yeah. So, I think it's dumb that he didn't call for literally any backup. Like, hey, meet me here. Let's go in the place together. Eh, what are you going to do? Cut. To, <laughs> that's almost worth a plot hole emporium. Eh, yeah. fuck it. <laughs> uh, cut to the car where Lindsay and Angel are riding along. Angel's doing an impressive job of empathizing with Lindsay without Lindsay hardly ever saying a word. Yeah, he's obviously getting under Lindsay's skin. He's hitting the mark. Continues to confuse Lindsay anyway. Yeah. I'd be kind of confused, too. Lindsay doesn't fucking know about the the revelation that Angel had and the, the change of mind and why all of a sudden he's no longer, like, gunning and trying to murder everyone. Like, sure. he doesn't know the backstory. So, like, I totally get his confusion. And, like, this is the dude who cut off his hand. Yeah. yeah he needs a little consistency is all. Yeah, I, I get that. I get that. And he's like, uh, what the fuck? You're all Captain save a soul now, right? So you and you, you really want to fucking share feelings? Okay. And Angel, of all people, tells him to go back to moping because that's what he's good at. Yeah. <laughs> Pop kettle black. Okay. Yeah, no shit. So they stop in front of this dingy ass little shitty closed down travel agency. And uh, I kind of enjoyed this part. They pop open the trunk to, <laughs> where they've stored the parole guy to confirm that they're at the right place, which was like, smart. But like if he lied about the address, he could easily be like, yeah, that's totally the place. Like, but if it's not totally the place. Then they're going to come back and be like, that's totally not the place. Yeah. You need to fucking tell us the right place. I really want to know what they did with this dude afterwards. They never show. Right? Like, well, I assume they let him go. And that's the whole idea of putting him in the trunk. Yeah. He's motivated now to give them the correct that, address. That, that is true. Because he doesn't get away unless they get the right address. Uh, then we get, I, I actually really like this bit because they were like walking up to the building. Angel is basically doing the rundown of everything they'd need to know. This is a place owned by Wolfram and Hart. It probably has all these security measures and, and all this. Lindsay's like, well, I don't have my laptop. I can't, like, what do you want me to do? Hack the system or something? Angel's like, no, I just say we fight. <laughs> Lindsay misinterprets <laughs> and jumps into his fighting stance at the ready to fight Angel, who's just like... No, fucking Dude, move, dumbass. Get out of the way. <laughs> Shoes him aside and just hucks the axe through the window. Yeah, and then they proceed to bust into the place way too easily. Way <laughs> too easily. Um, and he knows that guards are coming. And he's like, come on, Lindsay, burn off some of that aggression. Yeah. And uh, some fucking jabroni guard immediately yeah. leaps out at them. There's like, like half a dozen normal dudes in this place at most they right. take them out so fucking easy yeah they like, take him down in just a few seconds you know it's at this point it's obvious to me that wolfram and hart's downfall is that they're cheap asses <laughs> right? and they're not willing to actually spend money on shit and like actually put real good guards around their fucking projects like there's no reason angel should be so effective against them like he is yeah. he's one dude they know where he lives right and like they're just like like anybody with too much money wolfram and hart just really doesn't want to actually spend any money they're cheap asses <laughs> yeah that's cheap their asses and they're lazy yeah they don't want to get their hands dirty um, they want everybody else to do the job for them, but they won't pay them properly. Yeah, See how capitalism is just garbage, everybody? Exactly. So Angel notices that the floor in this office is hollow. He pushes the desk aside, rolls up the carpet to reveal a trap door with creepy stairs. They didn't even really do a good job of hiding it. Good enough. Most yeah. people aren't going to burst in there yeah, knowing fair. that there's body well, he, parts. He does have super, hero, super hearing, so like that makes some sense. Also that. 
Uh, but yeah, they go into the basement. They find a number of bodies in deep freeze for spare parts. As Angel mentions to Lindsay, they're spare parts for rich ass people like you. Like you. And, and I, don't know, I, I don't know about the deep freeze part. Um, we'll get to that they, in a moment. They look like they because they're like obviously pseudo conscious or some shit like that and it right, looks like they're two or, they get two or three of them to walk out with them oh, yeah. and the one guy that uh that bradley whatever his name is who lost his hand for Lindsay, is still conscious in yeah. there it turns out that the hand isn't evil the hand is suicidal yeah. Which, like, he wants Lindsay to kill him because he's in misery and torture because he's in a fucking box that he can't leave and he's missing body parts. Like, that's that's hell. That is hell. Yeah. And uh, he recognizes this guy, Bradley, as somebody that he used to work in the mailroom with and he's awake and he manages to mutter, kill. And Lindsay, not having any patience whatsoever, blurts out, who do you want me to kill, boy? Huh? 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 <laughs> Come on, Lassie. Tell me. Tell me. And he's like, kill me. Oh. Oh, kill you. Oh, okay. Oh, no. A moral conundrum. <laughs> Lindsay sucks at those. <laughs> I did really kind of enjoy the weirdness of like, he does kind of have this attitude of like, who do you want me to kill? I'll kill anyone you want. Yeah. Up until the dude's like, kill me. And I'll he's kill like, him for wait, you, bro. Wait, you want me to. I got this. You want me to to be merciful to you? Well, I, I can't do that. Well, that's just silly. What would you do, Angel? Hmm. <laughs> it's like, well, I know what I would do. Oh, you'd kill him? Uh, well, all right. I can do yeah, that. Yeah, I guess. Okay. You know what? That doesn't sound half bad. Note, Angel doesn't kill anybody. He actually lets other people out and like gets them out of there. Oh, this time. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. sure. Sure. Well, he's he's the good angel now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And not the uh, neutral sure. chaotic angel. Yeah. Um. Surprisingly, he doesn't really take too long to do the right thing. He pulls no. the plug, says goodbye to his mailroom buddy, and they thoroughly trash the place. Angel saves a couple of the non-mutilated ones and turns on the gas. As as they're walking up the stairs, he drops a lit piece of paper down the stairs as they leave, and basement go boom. Building go boom. Yeah, building fact, go boom. Whole building. Fuck it. Fuck that building. Yeah. Nobody needs travel agencies anyway. Uh, nope. They killed all the guards. They're oh, all dead. I they they didn't carry any of those guards out. That's fine. I'm just saying, Angel doesn't often kill people. I'm over it. But he definitely killed those people. Yeah, they worked for Wolfman. Huh? There, he also assisted in the death of lots of lawyers. Uh, yeah, yeah. He, he's got more <laughs> than enough blood on his hands. Fair. I'm with Wolfman Hart. Everybody should have a lawyer like this. Mr. Winters shall never be convicted of any crime, ever. Should you continue to harass our client, you'll be forced to bring that in the light of day. I want that stricken from the record. In place I'm told that's not all that healthy for you. We cut back to the hotel sometime later. Uh, when Angel returns back, he asks Cordy how she's doing. Mm -hmm. Now that the, the situation has resolved itself, or the visions stopped, and she's getting better, uh, but things are getting worse, and she's you can tell that she realizes things are getting worse, and she's kind of resigned herself to that, that fate, which is kind of an intense emotion, I think. Like, that's that's intense to me. She's accepted this fate because she truly feels that it's the right thing to do. I think, if anything, this shows the immense range of growth that this character has gone through. I just, I fucking love it, man. Yeah. At the very least, I think she just doesn't see any way out. Right. But when you're in that kind of situation where you're just, you know, you're, you're faced with a shitty situation and there's nothing you can do about it. You know, it comes down to what you can do about it is how you react to it. Yeah. And even, a, sh a shitty situation is e either good because you are accepting the good that comes with it because everything is gray and there's some sort of bright side to it and she finds it and she's doing good work and she can at least find some comfort in that. So like 
That is not a character that I thought I would have described from this character back when, you know, it was season two of Buffy, for fuck's sake. Season one, for Christ's sake. Yeah. I remember my visceral hatred of Cordelia yeah. in early Buffy. So, yeah, hell of a lot of character growth. Cut. Speaking of character growth, <laughs> cut over to the Gerba Thump Thump, where old 60 is about <laughs> to tell Lila that she didn't get the job. Lila nearly cracks under the pressure and reaches for her gun in her purse. Yeah. Well, she absolutely does. But Lindsay stops her and then makes this entire episode suck a whole lot less. <laughs> this is I wanted to write this whole scene down. Sure. I am so fucking mad that we have not gotten this over the top bombastic character because this whole fucking scene is just fantastic because Lindsay's off the goddamn hinges. And I love it. Off the rails, off his rocker, goes off about how his evil hand is what he's got that she doesn't got. He aggressively pats this bald guy, Charlie's head, wrestles the guard's gun away from him all the while. Like, it's my evil hand. Oops, sorry, evil hand. <laughs> while he's doing it, just <laughs> popping off wild shots towards Six Flags over there who's just gone completely stoic, if you will. Yeah. And uh, borderline catatonic. Catatonic, practically, yes. And, uh, and he very, goes off. Very much deer in headlights. If I don't move, he can't shoot me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he turns into a, well, no, he turns in, I was going to say he turns into a T-Rex, but he turns into Alan Grant. Yes. Uh, and uh, Lindsay's going off about how they should have chosen Lila because she's got all kinds of paperwork on them about their offshore accounts, stock manipulations. Wouldn't want that to get back to the senior partners. Only direct quote I have here is uh, Lindsay finally wraps it up and he's like, I'm unreliable. <laughs> I've got these evil hand issues and I'm bored with this crap. And besides, I'm leaving. So if you want to chase me, be my guest. And remember, evil. <laughs> <laughs> that I wrote down exactly that. Like we wrote exactly the same bit because that that was the that was the one moment in the episode that actually made me laugh out loud. Yeah. But more importantly, it made me laugh out loud because when I wrote it down, I wrote it down more as I'm leaving. So if you want to chase me, be my guest. But remember. Evil! Evil! <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but my favorite part is he, like, keeps repeating evil, like, waving his hand. He's like, evil, mm -hmm. evil, mm -hmm. evil hand, evil hand. And as he walks out, as you mentioned in the synopsis, he grabs Lila's butt. And then, like, when she turns and looks at him, she's like, evil? What? It's evil. evil. It's an evil hand. <laughs> <laughs> and thusly, he, he saves Lila's ass, which doesn't make him not a misogynist douche no, because he's I mainly mean, just saving his own ass. He is evil. It sure is funny, though. Thank God for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> and Nathan amends the minutes that Lila has been promoted and to call an ambulance, yeah. presumably for the guard's foot. And cut I to actually really liked that that Lindsay shot him. Like he actually, like he didn't just steal the gun away. But he actually like shot things in people, like like shit hit the fan. Truly, oh yeah, this I, this guard is definitely um, bleeding out through yeah. the foot right now. I appreciate you know. That, otherwise, the guard would have been trying to take him down through his whole speech. Can't have that. Yeah, fair. So outside at Lindsay's truck. Yep. Probably later that night, Angel meets Lindsay at his truck, and they kind of have a a reminiscent moment of the good old days in the fifties when this truck was you know brand new. And they're not really friends, but they kind of have a decent little rapport going going here. It's the obligatory, but not at all necessary, well, time to hit the dusty trail conversation. <laughs> and it's got that serene, bittersweet feeling of closure and relief with a budding frenemy situation. And remember, if you come back, I'll kill you. I'll kill you. <laughs> Don't forget, we're not friends. Don't ever let me see you in my town again, you know, you hear? <laughs> Lindsay gives Angel some sage advice before he goes. Don't let them make you play their games. Make them play yours. Legit quote of the day. Lindsay says, I hope you're not waiting for me to tell you that I learned some kind of a lesson. <laughs> that I had a big moral crisis, but now I see the light. 
Angel responds, if you told me that, then I'd have to kill you. I'm just here to say bon voyage. Don't come back. Yeah. Uh, but I do like the last thing he says, uh, something about uh, don't speed, you know. A lot of cops out there. A lot there. of cops out there. To which, of course, Lindsay's like, you know what? Fuck you, Angel, and floors it. And Angel put a big fucking cop su- cops suck like sign on the back of Lindsay's truck. And I just thought that was hilarious. My first thought was, wow, why would... Why would Lindsay want a sign on his tailgate that says cops suck? That's really dumb. Oh, Angel put it there. Okay. My my <laughs> favorite part, though, of all this is right before this, Angel mentions being glad this is a relatively amiable parting because he didn't want things to get immature, mm-hmm. you know, kind of at a nod of, of their interactions through the episode. And then Angel did the the whole kick me sign bull, immaturity bullshit. And that just, to me, is fucking hilarious. It's a wonderful cherry on top. It's a great stinger ending to the episode. I loved it. Yeah. Gerarg. Gerarg. Is this for me? I must be ready. I need my strength. strength. Give, 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 give me more! Night, I shall give, walk give, in give, here. Give, 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 give. Hold on. You've got something in your eye. Well, how'd you feel about this episode, Rex? I actually fucking loved it. Like, it was fantastic. It was all right at the end of the day, all said and done. It had a slow start, but there's nothing particularly in this episode that I found distasteful. I thought the parts that were good were quite good. The parts that were bad were, eh, fine. And unlike some past episodes where, like, yeah, they had they covered some good stuff, but there was some bad things mixed in there. I felt, you know, nothing like that. But I liked rounding out the character of Lindsay. I liked round, how they rounded out the character of Cordy. I liked how this episode really showed us that Angel truly is back to his old self. You know, being able to empathize with people and, and be kind of friendly like we haven't seen in a while. I fucking loved it. It was, I thought it was fantastic. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah, I thought there were some clunky plot points that I'm in no state of mind to rattle off verbatim now, but I, I mentioned them throughout the episode. Yeah. Um, but it's all totally overshadowed by uh, some of the really nice, well-rounded character development that we get here. And it, like I said, the ending with Lindsay made the whole episode absolutely worth it. Yes. that For that final scene, or the... S- second to last scene yeah. where he quits was epic like they, they could have done some different things as far as the timing and progression of the story in this episode that could have definitely improved it but like i, I was confused by the whole evil eyeball stabbing the evil yeah, eyeball that like, didn't make any fucking sense they definitely missed the mark on some kind of important plot points now lila I definitely do, hold on just real quick lila definitely was a bit out of character i thought she was way more hardcore than this yeah she shouldn't be so insecure and upset by all of this she's always been way more hardcore than Lindsay. Yeah, it, it was a bad lila episode yeah um i will say they kind of hinted at what happened to that family but they didn't do a particularly good job and looking at the wiki uh, told me that Wolfman Hart killed the family. Like they, they're like, well, this fucked up. Uh, let's clean house. Like, who knows why the dude stabbed his own eye out? But like they, like they just got rid of the family. But makes sense. And I don't know if that's canonical or anything. There's nothing specifically in this episode that leads me to believe that that's what they did. If not, you know, relocation or something. Sure. But like, who the fuck knows? They did definitely leave that part out. But overall, I really enjoyed it. I'm disappointed in that they keep having these really good episodes for these side characters as they're walking out the fucking door. Hmm. So that that's a trend they need to stop, and they need to start having these good episodes with characters that are sticking around. So hopefully that happens. Yeah, that'd be nice. Couldn't agree more. Uh, do you have a quote of the day? Yeah, I don't have any uh, I don't have any great quotes of the day, but uh, for the sake of picking something that I enjoyed, let's go with Lindsay's uh, one of his last lines. 
I'm unreliable. I've got these evil hand issues, and I'm bored with this crap. And besides, I'm leaving. So if you want to chase me, be my guest. And remember, evil. But beyond that, evil. And a nice I, little, nice little garden path. I'm sad because like that's, that's lots all of little I have. old ladies. That's that's about all I have. With too, too many parcels. Oh, that was yeah. yeah well, I mean, there, there's there's like I said, slim pickings on this episode. It wasn't particularly a witty well-written episode yeah not a lot of banter in this one um i'm gonna say because this would have kind of been my runner-up rather than quote of the day interaction of the day would have been the scene with angel and cordy over the sandwiches like i thought that was really good um no real specific line out of that that felt you know standout ish but i think it was good growth for the characters in their relationship and i felt that that you know, Angel did exactly what he should have done in that situation. Which it definitely was, warmed my heart, cockles. Yeah, exactly. So exactly. That's all I need for a quote. Uh, warm cockle hearts, whatever for of the day. There you go. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And if you like that, well, then I guess you like Ale with Angel, which this has been <laughs> another episode of. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook. Uh, definitely, absolutely. Review us on iTunes. It's one of the best things you can do for us if you want to support our podcast completely for free. And if you'd like to go above and beyond and support us not completely for free, you can buy some of our stuff at www.beerwithbuffy.com slash shop. And remember, if you review us, send us a screenshot of your review via email or Facebook or wherever, and we will send you a free sticker. We also do stickers. That's a thing. If you would like to donate to us, you can head on over to patreon.com slash beer with Buffy. Uh, if you ever have any questions, comments, or concerns, email us at beer with Buffy at gmail.com. You can always text us or send us a voicemail at two, six, nine, seven, four, three, zero, seven, eight, three. As always, big shout out. And thank you to JJ Treadway for all of our opening, closing and transitional music. This has been Ale with Angel. I'm Josh. I'm Rex. Have a good night. Briefs be with you. Keanu Sweet, Josh. Whoa. Whoa. You are the slayer. Lives depend upon you. I make allowances for your years, but I expect a certain amount of responsibility, and instead of which you enslave yourself to this, this cult. You don't like the color? <laughs> done why are we watching this <laughs>